Okay. Uh, thank you all very much for coming and welcome to Columbia. I'm uh, Steve Call and I'm the Dean of the School and this is uh, Sheila Cornell, the uh, Dean of Faculty, Dean of Academic Affairs. And uh, I just want to make a few opening uh, remarks and then we'll be happy just to quickly get to your questions. So our, our work on this uh, project lasted about uh, three and a half months and it just wouldn't have been possible without the contributions of a number of people who I just wanted to thank as we get started. Uh, first, uh, Carl Summers, uh, former, formerly of the New York Times, who helped to uh, edit uh, the report. Uh, Andy Young, uh, who used to work at The New Yorker and is now a fact checker for uh, book authors uh, who, who helped to fact check the report. Uh, Lee Levine, who offered uh, legal advice and support. Um, Columbia University and particularly Jane Booth and uh, President Lee Bollinger who really encouraged us to, to go forward with this project. Uh, we wanted to mention Andrew Elliott uh, who's the managing editor of the Daily Cavalier at the University of Virginia who was uh, very helpful to us as we were working on this. Um, you know this report was Rolling Stone's idea and it should be remembered that they uh, undertook it voluntarily was not a barrel of uh, fun for them, uh, but they cooperated fully and they acted professionally throughout and we're grateful for that. Uh, and we'd really like to acknowledge uh, all the other uh, reporters at major newspapers and wire services and broadcast networks and at the Cavalier uh, Daily who, who really broke the ground on this story long before we got involved. Uh, so this report really uh, wouldn't have been possible without the foundation created by a lot of other journalists and uh, uh, I d we just want to make that clear. Some of them are probably here today. And uh, finally we want to thank our co-author uh, Derek Kravitz uh, who must be here. He's over there in the corner in his usual recessive way. Uh, he's a former reporter at the Washington Post and at the AP. He's a postgraduate uh, research scholar here at uh, Columbia. He's a former student of Sheila's in our investigative reporting program and he did a ton of work on this project and was always reliable and uh, never fussed and his contributions were just indispensable. So uh, finally just a few words about what we set out uh, to do here. So this, this report is very much intended as a piece of journalism about a failure of journalism. And uh, in that sense our first objective was to lay out what had happened at Rolling Stone, uh, how it happened, and why it happened. And uh, although we, we did concentrate our efforts on the details of Rolling Stone's reporting and editing, uh, we, we also had the freedom to investigate any aspect of the story that we thought was germane and, and in the public interest. And uh, so in the end, the final report had, uh, at least in our minds, several intended purposes. One was to illuminate the key reasons why Rolling Stone's uh, reporting, in this case, why the failure was avoidable, and to draw lessons uh, from that. Another reason was to assess independently um, another purpose was to assess independently some of the subjects that Rolling Stone covered beyond Jackie's narrative, particularly the timeline of how a UVA handled Jackie's information. Uh, and then the report also addresses Rolling Stone's editorial policies and makes some recommendations to the magazine. And finally, um, it tries to evaluate how journalists might begin to improve our own practices to define best practices when we're reporting about uh, rape cases on campus or anywhere else. So uh, with that, Sheila is going to uh, call on uh, folks who want to ask questions. We just ask you to please wait for the wireless microphone uh, and identify yourselves when you uh, speak because some folks have live feeds going and, and they need the microphone to pick them up. Steve, before, I mean, you were making a list of thank yous. I'd also like to thank the Columbia Journalism Review, who is our publishing partner. Liz Spade is here, and she worked through the night to make this happen. Um, please keep your questions short, and if you do that, we promise to keep our answers short. Um, yes, please. Please identify yourself and wait for the microphone. Yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, Juliana Goldman with CBS News. I'm wondering if over the course of your investigation, whether you gave any thought or questioned the idea of keeping Jackie anonymous. Well, we, she was anonymous in the report. We nev it was never our intention to make her identity public. We knew who she was, and I believe her name has been out there, but there was no reason for us to make known her true identity. Even though the, the microphone, please. <laughs> Thank you. Just as a follow-up, even though one of the main takeaways from the report is that ultimately uh, this was all sourced to the account of a single individual. Yes, but we found as well that this uh, failure was not the subject's or the source's fault as a matter of journalism. It was a, it was the product of failed methodology. And we didn't feel that uh, her role in the story should be a subject of a report that was seeking accountability for, for a failure of journalism. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, your name and your user again. Hi, uh, Lloyd Grove with The Daily Beast. Um, you say that they cooperated fully with you, Rolling Stone did. But I'm just wondering, given that they asserted attorney-client privilege, and we all know how important uh, lawyers are in the preparation of articles like this, and they could have waived the privilege, do you really think they cooperated fully with you? Well, we, we said in the report that they declined to answer questions when they asserted attorney-client privilege. We did talk with them about this issue at the beginning, and we said we would not refrain from investigating the legal issues around the story, the legal review. And we did do some reporting that, as with any other piece of journalism, if we asked them questions that they didn't want to answer, they could decline to answer them. We'd say in the report that they declined to answer them and why, and that's the way we ended up handling this. We were quite curious about that issue. We've been around uh, these kinds of um, stories and closings before, and so we did ask a lot of questions. Um, we only got a paragraph worth of information that we were able to clarify in a constructive way, and it's there in the report. Um, yes, please. Um, yeah. Alicia Hasty, NBC News. Um, the publisher has said that the blame still lies with Jackie. Do you think that they're blaming the victim too much? We believe, if you read our report closely, that the problems we outlined there were problems of methodology. There were problems of newsroom standards and procedures. Um, they had nothing to do, I mean, they, those were the key issues of our report. We don't believe that in this case, Jackie was to blame. Flat out, whose fault was this? Well, it was, the, it was the collective fault of the reporter, the editor, the editor's supervisor, and the fact-checking department. Last one, I promise. Do you think that everybody at Rolling Stone should keep their jobs? We pointed out systemic and institutional problems. We leave it up to Rolling Stone to decide how best to deal with these problems. Thank you. Um, yes, please. Katie Anders with The Guardian. Um, did you ever consider looking at any of Sabrina Erdely's earlier stories with Rolling Stone? Was that ever on the table with the magazine? We read them, uh, but we didn't have access to the same kind of information about them, and we did not go back out and re-report them. Um, we recognized that that was something that we might, uh, you know, that if we had a year, we, we could have gone out and, and kind of broken every one of those down and seen if we'd found any useful insights. but. Uh, we decided, um, based on our review of her earlier work, to concentrate on, on this story as the case study. Sorry, just to clarify, you said that you... Yeah, mi microphone, please. Yeah. Just to clarify, you said that you did not have access to the same sort of information. Do you mean that the magazine did not offer any additional fact-check files, or you were not going to pursue that? Uh, we didn't ask for them. I'm not sure whether they would have offered them if we had, but we didn't ask. Um, yes. David Wright with ABC News. If I could just follow up on the earlier question here. I mean, your, your, your report is framed as uh, a matter of journalistic best practices. Um, and on the accountability question, I wonder if it were your newsroom, shouldn't somebody lose their job? Well, as you know, as a veteran newsman, hypotheticals are a very uh, un, un uh, usually kind of an unhelpful question. I would say that... But still, that's a kind of accountability, and that's, yeah, a, that's a big but, statement of accountability, isn't it? 
it is a big statement of accountability and it belongs with Rolling Stone. Look, we're not the DA's office here. We're not a special prosecutor. We did not find, and as we say in the report, we didn't find evidence of the kind of dishonesty, invention of facts, lying to colleagues, plagiarism, that in our experience and probably yours, you would regard as grounds for automatic firing or severe sanctions. Absent that kind of dishonesty, it just didn't seem appropriate for us to judge individuals who we have only met through the context of reporting on a single story. They've been employed at Rolling Stone for decades, and so it's appropriate for Rolling Stone to sort out that accountability. Yes, at the back, please. Um, your name, please. Uh, Marianne Georgentopoulos from BuzzFeed News. Um, can you talk a little bit about how much Will Dana really knew um, he said he was unaware the Rolling Stone did not know the full extent of Drew's identity, but then he later on gave the go-ahead to not pursue Drew. So how much did he really know about this person throughout the reporting process? I think we, be we believe that he was fairly removed from the actual editing and supervision of the story. He did approve the final story. He did ask about the three friends and whether they could be identified. He did ask about Drew's identity, but he was not, you know, day by day supervising the story. Yes, please. Uh. Sarah Gannon with CNN. On the accountability issue, I wonder, uh, away from the firings, what do you think about the decision not to change any of their policies? I don't think they said that. Didn't they say in their statement that they would take these policies to heart and make, you know, and, and revise and review their newsroom procedures in the light of the findings of our report? I believe they said that they didn't think that there was anything wrong with their policies and that this wouldn't happen again because it was an isolated situation. Well, they, they said that to us during the course of the investigation and then we, we quoted them to that effect and, and then we said we thought actually the policies were at issue. And I think what Sheila is saying, we'd have to, we don't want to guess at this, but I think in the statement they issued last night, they referred to changes beyond what they had said in interviews for our report. Okay, and the second thing is, um, there was a big chunk of this story that was never disputed, and it was about UVA's historical response to sexual assaults, including its response to Jackie's claims, which were public before this article was published. Now that they've taken it down, do you think that an important part of that story was lost? We did deal with some of those issues in our reporting. We looked at what um, the university administration did at the time when Jackie first reported her assault. We saw that Rolling Stone had an improper understanding of what was actually reported and saw and judged uh, UVA's actions in the light of what she thought UVA knew but actually didn't know. So we dealt with some of those issues. Yeah. Yes, please. Hi, Christine Rafini with CBS News. One of the things that we came across reporting this story was a lot of the people we talked to who had been interviewed by Sabrina said they felt she came into this with a bias. And you guys talked about this a little bit, but how much of a role do you think it played that she, it seems, based on some of the people she interviewed, said that she went in with the narrative kind of pre-constructed and then looked for the stories that fit that rather than letting, letting them play out and letting the story unfold as it would. Well, we talked about, um, I don't know what bias you mean, but we talked in our report about confirmation bias, about the tendency to see facts in, in a story or in a case that fit a certain narrative or a pre certain preconceived notion. I believe she thought that the, she was very sympathetic to the victims of sexual assault that she interviewed both at UVA and, with other, and at other universities, and that she felt that something had to be done for them. She was moved by their stories and by their frustrations. There was also not enough transparency on the part of UVA for her to be able to get the full story. So bias was a factor, a lack of information and a lack of transparency in the university's part was also a factor in the way the story was eventually shaped. And you know, there's, there's another important subject embedded in that question, which is this form of narrative journalism where you select a single illustrative case to tell a larger story. And we might have uh, tried to write about that issue at greater length, but in the end we decided to stick close to the subject at hand because we felt we had a lot to say there. But it's interesting because you know, I'm sure, many journalists 
who decide in advance that they're looking for an illustrative story of some larger subject that they believe they understand. And I've certainly been around that work uh, in lots of different settings and seen it succeed. But there is a cautionary tale here about the relationship between the selection of this illustrative narrative and the underlying assumptions that the reporter then uh, became entangled in. And it doesn't mean that that methodology shouldn't be ever used, but it, I think this is a, uh, an example where you would really uh, learn to be cautious about knowing in advance what it is you think you're trying to illustrate. Um, at the back, please, yes. Uh, my colleague over on the other side of the room alluded to this. I'm Jonathan Wachtel with Fox News. Uh, you didn't give a straight answer, though, as to what you would do uh, if you were in charge of, of the magazine, personally, what you would do, given, given what you've investigated, uh, would you, in fact, sack certain staff? And also, can you speak to the long-term damage that this has done to integrity of journalism, integrity of Rolling Stone? So I, I, I can't give you a straight answer because I don't have the information that I would require as a, as a boss to make a judgment as important as someone's livelihood because these are... Uh, not uh, failures of dishonesty in an individual. They are systematic failures, collective failures, that involve people who have worked at the same place for a long period of time. And I wouldn't want a judgment made about my livelihood by an outsider on the basis of, you know, in very limited interactions with these individuals. We weren't asked to investigate that question. We didn't have the information to make a judgment of that type. So we didn't. Um, on the damage question, I think we, you know, we are particularly focused in the report on the, uh, the idea that it would be a really unfortunate outcome if journalists backed away from doing this kind of reporting as a result of this highly visible failure. Because this is important work, and it's hard work. That's uh, not to make an excuse for this failure. but. This kind of uh, reporting environment, this kind of subject, is, um, you know, it's a new frontier for serious accountability journalism. There are a lot of individuals and a lot of institutions out there that seek not to be held accountable for uh, allegations of sexual violence that are underdeveloped. Uh, this is before the police have gotten to the case. This is before a prosecutor has evaluated it. So that's, that's a space where journalism normally functions. But I think there is a, con a context here, which is our record as a profession in reporting on sexual violence is not great. And this is uh, an area where we have got to have a conversation amongst ourselves to figure out how to, how to get better, because it's important work. I agree there. The Rolling Stone story shows us how to move forward on this very fraught issue of reporting on, on campus rape. And it is useful to us as individual journalists and as a profession to reflect on this. It's a very useful case on how to report with sensitivity about victims of sexual assault while also verifying and corroborating the information that they provide. Um, yes, please, you've been raising your hand. Yeah. Hi, I'm Michelle Goldberg from The Nation. I'm wondering, Jackie's story still seems um, unsettled after this report has come out, did you make any effort to re-report kind of what actually happened to her, find out if something did indeed actually happen to her? That's been unclear from especially the Washington Post stories. They showed some instances of her being sort of a fabulous, other instances where the three friends did indeed believe that she had been victimized, if not in the exact way that she described. Um, did you try to get to the bottom of that and kind of, or if not, why did you feel like she didn't like that didn't need to be relitigated in this report. We we made uh, we we did work on that. We worked on it for a considerable amount of time, and we really were in the end unable to go beyond where the police ended up, which was that <laughs> the facts of what happened to her that night were unknowable on the basis of the evidence available. We were particularly um, we took particular note of the police department's findings about something that we had been interested in, which is given the ambiguity around that month, September 2012, if you could examine uh, the phone records, you might have a better reliable sense of what happened. But the police, as we understand it at their press conference, reported and afterwards to us reported that 
those records uh, didn't exist, uh, at least the ones that they had tried to access uh, no longer existed. The Charlottesville police interviewed 70 people and they didn't get any farther than we did to say what happened to Jackie that night was a mystery. So we ended up not really writing about it in the report even though we did a fair amount of um, work on it. Um, yes, you haven't asked a question. Yes. Hi, I'm Bill McGowan, journalist, author. I run a blog called Coloring the News. Uh, one of the things I was struck by in piecing these things together and doing some re-reporting is the very meager amount of time that Sabrina Rubin Erdley spent on the ground in Charlottesville itself doing reporting for a 9,000 word investigative piece. She spent two, maybe three days. The first meet with Jackie was during that long weekend of September 11th, and she never went back. Do you think that played a role in this at all, or could you maybe comment on how it did, and could you also possibly explain why, I didn't see it in the report, but I, again, I didn't read the report as closely as I would have liked. But did you find that, that she did not spend a lot of time on the ground? I don't think that was the key problem in this report. She did eight interviews with Jackie. In the on the phone and Skype, yes, right? Yes, right. But, but, Yes. But she only met her for the first in, time in September yes, 11th. In, in September, but she produced a 400-page transcript of all her interviews. It was really not a question of not spending enough time in the ground. It was, as we pointed out in the report, questions of putting the burden of the entire story almost entirely on a single source. Yes, please, at the back there. Um, given Rolling Stone, oh, sorry, Sarah Ellison with Vanity Fair, um, given, Rolling, given Rolling Stone's response to your report, why do you think they asked you to do the report in the first place? You should ask them. <laughs> <laughs> they told us that they, among other things, uh, they wanted this to be a teachable error. And we said, well, that's good because that's the business we're in. So we took them at their word that this was meant to be something <coughs> constructive. Uh, so we knew as we started that a lot of other reporters had broken the ground, that most of what um, people understood about why the story had failed was roughly correct. There were some areas where we could add some insight and, and go deeper. But by and large, our motivation was to try to construct a case study that would be reliable and useful for you know, young journalists, uh, for journalism students, for the public, and for everyone who is affected by this failure to, to be able to see exactly how the editorial process broke down. And uh, so I think they were, at least at, at the start, they told us they were supportive of that ambition, and uh, I haven't spoken to them uh, about it more recently. Yes, please. Hi, Erin Carmon, MSNBC. Um, I'm wondering if uh, something that you guys mentioned a few times in the report and that came out of Sabrina Rubin Erdely's mouth herself is that this idea of the dramatic example, uh, this emblematic report. Part of the issues that came up in the piece, and you guys didn't spend a lot of time on this, was that at no point did she admit what she didn't know or how she knew what she knew. So she talked about the friends and she didn't attribute that that was from a single source and not from the friends. I'm wondering if you guys could comment as teachers of journalism about the issues in, in narrative journalism but in journalism at large uh, in trying to find a sort of unnuanced bad guy, good guy kind of story, uh, the, the kind that really actually did get a lot of attention here and ended up blowing up. Yeah, so there's three or four good subjects in that. On, uh, one of them is um, attribution. So in the report, we did try to be very clear and strong about what we thought were the inadequacies, inadequacies of their attribution of information. The scene where the three uh, friends are depicted on the night um, of September 28th there, it's just not clear to the reader where that where those quotations come from. It's not clear to the reader that they didn't reach the three individuals. It's not clear to the reader they didn't know who the three individuals really were, and that all the information came from Jackie. That kind of attribution uh, opaqueness is just um, a ticket to trouble. It's also bad journalistic practice, even when it's not papering over holes in reporting, as it was in this case. And there were other instances of attribution uh, failure that we 
wrote about specifically in the report. Then there's the subject of the kind of omniscient voicing in magazine writing. And we try to take the view that uh, there is a tension in narrative writing between constantly putting in she said, she said, according to her, and the flow that a reader uh, ideally is looking for on the page. But, and so we, we think there's room for some diverse voicing in magazine writing, but when the reporting is solid and, and when attribution is fundamental to a reader's understanding as it was in some of those instances, you just have to do it even if it breaks up the flow. And uh, so, yeah, I think the only other subject there that we didn't write about, but which we certainly reflected on, is how do you think about the shock narrative at the top of a story? Of course, if it's uh, valid, if it's adjudicated, if it's true, uh, and it's a way to draw readers into an important subject, then uh, that's part of what narrative writing is about. But there was something about that um, choice in the writing that uh, made some early readers just uh, start to blog and speculate that this doesn't feel right to me. And so as a writer, when, when you're in that kind of a zone and you're, and you're as thinly sourced as that, it's a pretty good clue to, to pull back. Um, yes, please. Yeah. Yes. Um, can you wait for the microphone? Thanks. I wondered what, if anything, is known about the nature of Sabrina Rubin Ederle's um, relationship financially with um, the with Rolling Stone, and what the costs might have been had the story been killed um, as problems arose or in that sort of two week. Well, we don't know. We don't know. She. We know that she's a contributing editor there. That she has written quite a number of articles for Rolling Stone for the past six or eight years. I. I don't think it was a problem of the story being killed. She did interview a number of women, and any of them could have been the dramatic, illustrative example that she could have used for the story, but none of them are quite as shocking as Jackie's story was. Yes, so she, as, she yeah. had another story there based on other examples. Yeah. So as, as we're saying here, it's not the problem of, the na of narrative or a dramatic example, it's the problem of verification and corroboration here. Yes, please. Has your name, the women seniors? Um, so the University of uh, Virginia has had a very bad press, uh, especially pertaining uh, violence against women. And the first phone call that um, uh, Sabrina made is to a staff member of the University of Virginia, Emily Randa. Have you ever considered that um, this story was gave by the University of Virginia to the Rolling Stone, such as a PR? ploy after the bad publicity given by the media to the university? Mm, no, I don't, I don't believe so. There was no, I mean, the choice, Jack, uh, the choice of Jackie was Sabrina's choice. It was not Emily Renda's choice. Emily, in fact, introduced Jackie to a number of other sexual assault victims on campus. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah. Thank you. Tom Clute, CNN. Uh, you said last night that uh, in your uh, review you found no invention of facts, uh, no instances of dishonesty on the part of the reporter, um, but she clearly misrepresented uh, this arrangement that she supposedly made with Jackie uh, not to contact the friends. In fact, as your report indicated, Jackie even provided a, a, a means by which she could have done that. Uh, in her story, she also said that she reached out to one of the friends. Uh, in fact, your report found that she did not do that. So I'm just wondering, given that, can you really say that she didn't engage in, in dishonesty? Well, on the second point, she did reach out to the friend, but through a friend. Uh, so it's, it's debatable. On the first point, we did find that in the aftermath of the story's public unraveling, um, not just the writer, but the editors at Rolling Stone took shelter under the defense that the reason they had had this uh, unravel on them was because they had been too sensitive to Jackie's position. So a number of statements in public were made along those lines. And um, as we got into it, we did feel that it was important to try to um, make clear that the evidence doesn't support that defense because Otherwise, journalists would learn the wrong lesson about what went wrong here. This, 
failure was avoidable without reference to their sensitivity to Jackie's position. They were struggling to think about how do you report on someone in her position. Um, but their failure was not related uh, to that uh, struggle. Um, yes. Um. <laughs> the back piece, yes. Yes. Hi, uh, Sydney Smith from iMedia Ethics. Um, did you find out in your investigation any indication of any lawsuits or potential lawsuits against Rolling Stone? I think Phi Kappa Psi has publicly made a statement saying they were considering legal action. Um, we don't know what's happened since then. Um, over on this side, have you asked a question? You have, so <laughs> let's, have, let's have you an, ask a question. Marley Hall, CBS News. What kind of precedent is there for news organizations requesting this type of review? Uh, it's interesting. At the New York Times and the Washington Post, uh, such reviews have been conducted in-house, in but with similar terms. So someone, a reporter or an editor, a team is commissioned and given uh, a remit by the executive editor, just do your work and we'll publish it without getting in your way. Um, and that's worked pretty well uh, in some of those other cases. We looked at those reports uh, for modeling as we were getting started. I think Rolling Stone was in a position where they didn't have the capacity to do this in-house, and so it made, if they were gonna do it, it made sense to go outside in some way, not necessarily to us, but um, other than that, I mean, I, I think in the case of some of the broadcast networks and others, people have chosen to bring in more uh, lawyers or, uh, other kinds of experts who are not journalists. So I, I myself uh, prefer journalism about journalism problems rather than having someone uh, come in from a different profession. So uh, in that sense, I think it's a good model. Yes, at the back. Hi, Laura Lee with CNN. Um, do you agree with Rolling Stone's decision to take down the story? It was, it was their decision. Um, it was a story that they've already retracted. It was a story that they've admitted was flawed and problematic. Um, it was probably a wise decision. I mean, the print copies of the magazine are still around. If you look at uh, the Wayback Machine, you'll find <laughs> the, the story still there. So nothing ever disappears on the internet. Um, yes? Hi, uh, Peter Stern from Capital New York. You mentioned in the report that uh, Erdely had failed to present specific details of her reporting to uh, Phi Kappa Psi. She essentially just asked them for comment. But you didn't really mention why she may have done that. Do you think she did that because she knew that the reporting she had done was problematic or thinly sourced? Why do you think she didn't present what she found to Phi Kappa Psi and let them confirm or deny it. So we tried to be specific about that as best we could in the report, and it's a little bit complicated, and I'm not sure that it reads uh, as cleanly on the first reading as it might, but essentially it has to do with um, what she told us is really the answer I can give you. What Sabrina Erdely told us about that was that she believed the fraternity had already been informed about the details that she possessed by the University of Virginia. Now that turned out to be a misunderstanding. Um, and in our judgment, looking at the journalism practice issues, it's not a reason not to provide the full load of details uh, at that moment. But when we asked her the question you just asked us, her answer was, I felt like I gave them a full chance to respond, and I also believe that they already knew all the details because UVA had briefed them. So, you know, she believed in, in the story up to the time it was published. The story unraveled in her mind after that phone call with Jackie, which was the lead in the report, it was the first week of December. So it was not that she didn't believe there were any gaps in her story, she believed her story to be true. Um, yes. Patrick Barnas of Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. 
one of the most striking details um, in your report, uh, I found something about the very first interview um, Audley did with Jackie, and the detail is that she herself found the detail of the shattered glass table immediately implausible. And so apparently confirmation bias uh, was in it from the, from the very start. And it seems to me that this must have something to do with the wider frames of narrative about this kind of uh, uh, things uh, in, the wider, in the wider public debate. So while in retrospect, this detail where everybody says it's like from a horror movie, uh, it's sort of the best instance you can give why the story is implausible. At first, it seemed plausibly because of this very detail from like a horror movie scenario. So my question would be whether you um, considered including some more analytical reflection about these uh, more general uh, narratives, uh, the kind of topoi uh, surrounding this issue in the wider political debate in this country. Well, I think it's a, it's a, a version of a, a question that we, we were talking about before about the risks of certain kinds of narrative writing and narrative choice. and. We didn't step back and write at length about that. We violated, we did, uh, people have noted that the report is longer than the original story. Um, we, we own that. Um, we did, for a time we had a rule that this report should not be longer than the original <laughs> story. We just uh, didn't uh, get there. It became also, we had to manage both a long version and a short version and keeping them in sync was a little bit complicated. So. Um, in any event, that's a subject that we're interested in that we just didn't have the space to write about, and I'm sure that we'll be in the classroom reflecting on it and trying to figure out how to teach it, because it's, it's a very good subject. I believe your question was whether the, sto uh, she be um, the author believed the story because it fit a prevailing narrative about campus rape. Yeah. Yes, and whether you might and, sort of and, have some hints about and, and the narrative. And whether, you know, mm. believing in prevailing narratives. And I think, I think the general rule is there, if a story fits into a prevailing narrative, you should be even more skeptical about it. Right, and there's, a question, of of, red there's flags, a question of your yeah. basic orientation. Do you feel like you know what the subject is and you're just looking for an illustrative case to demonstrate what you believe you already know, or are you investigating the underlying subject itself? Are you coming there with an empirical state of mind, or are you coming there with an illustrative state of mind? Um, let's, who else has not asked a question? I can give you first yeah, dibs, there. yes. Yeah. Hi, it's Ravi Samaya from the New York Times. I was just wondering, you guys have been immersed in Rolling Stone's editorial process for some months now. Do the two of you trust what you read in the magazine now? <laughs> <laughs> Being very, imp we're, we're empiricists, unless, you know, there is evidence to the contrary, we would, you know, judge each story on its merits. Yeah. And, sorry, one tiny follow-up. Were you disappointed uh, that after reading the report, Jan Wenner came out and said, well, it started with Jackie, which struck me as the, the opposite of the conclusion of your report? We do disagree with any suggestion that, that this was Jackie's fault. As a matter of journalism, this was a failure of methodology and of policy and of practice, and it wasn't uh, the subject's failure. Yes, you haven't asked a question, right? Uh, Lauren Gambino with The Guardian. Um, I was just wondering if there was any advice to Rolling Stone about how, going forward, they can, um, ins they can make sure that the readers trust their reporting from here on out? Was there any advice that they might need to do things differently in their next big cover story or you know, make clear certain points in a story so that their readers trust them? Well, well our report makes clear what they, should do, what they should be doing moving forward. We said you know, they should have a policy on the use of pseudonyms, consider, <laughs> consider banning them. Two, they should always be checking derogatory information. Three, they should ask detailed questions of the other side of, of uh, you know, any allegations of wrongdoing or misbehavior. They should always ask detailed, quite detailed and specific questions. So we, those were the recommendations that this should be instilled in reporting practice and reporting procedures in the newsroom. I think we would just add sort of on the page itself, um, clearer attribution is the best uh, defense against 
um, this kind of uh, complex reporting. And so it might be interesting for them uh, to experiment with clearer, fuller, more routine attribution than they have routinely in the past. They should be transparent about what they know and what they don't know. Um, you can come back to Trinidad Yes, yes, first. second round, <laughs> yes. Um, thanks. I'm just wondering if you can address concerns that one of the ultimate failures of the Rolling Stone piece is that it actually damages efforts uh, to address sexual assaults on college campuses. Well, that was what some of our sources said, but I think it's a mixed picture. If you look at UVA, this story has actually spurred action on the part of the administration and the Board of Visitors to take you know, even stronger measures against campus sexual assault. It's um, generated a robust discussion in the UVA campus on a problem that's been in the midst for a long time. Um, it may be discouraging women from coming out publicly for fear that their accounts are going to be questioned, just as Jackie's account was. Um, but, you know, it's, I don't think it's one way or the other. It's probably more a mixed picture, and it's too early to be able to say what the long-term impact of it is. So are you yeah. saying that there's a silver lining to all of this? I always believe in silver <laughs> linings. Yes, I, I, I think, as far as UVA concerned, this was a moment for a bust and healthy conversation involving various constituencies in the universities about a problem that has been there for a long time. Yeah. Um, second round. Yes, <laughs> sir. Yeah. Um, now that there have been a lot of apologies given, and early has apologized to the readers of Rolling Stone and her colleagues in the university of community, uh, don't you think that the fraternity deserves an apology as well? Was, wasn't there a blanket apology from Rolling Stone about everybody who, who, who has been... I don't know. remember who was in I don't remember being apology. apologized to. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Do you believe there was any sort of ethical failure on Rolling Stone by placing some of the blame on Jackie or putting too much trust in Jackie? Two different subjects. Placing the blame on her after the story uh, blew up, yeah, we, just, we think that was not the right uh, way to understand what had happened and not the right way to articulate to the public uh, their, their position. Um, placing the so much of the weight of the story on a single source, maybe it's semantics, but that, I wouldn't think of that so much as a matter of ethics as a matter of practice. It's just bad practice. Yes, please. You guys have acknowledged today that there were a few things in the story that were true and that there were other um, women who could have been used as a better anecdote. Do you think that this story should be rewritten? Do you think it, the, Taking it down completely might let UVA, UVA off the hook a little bit? I, you know, I, I haven't given that enough thought to give a thoughtful <laughs> answer. It's an, it, because this question of retracting the story and taking it down has only come up in the last 24 hours, and we haven't been involved in any discussion about it. Um, it's an interesting problem, as she was referring to the Wayback Machine. You know, this, you, you wouldn't want to lose the artifact of the story as a subject of research or scholarship or people wanting to know what was there. Um, as to whether Rolling Stone itself should go back and try to um, re-report the, at the University of Virginia, that might be complicated for them. But I think one point that we, um, we made was that um, we hope other journalists will keep alive the discussion about how to do this work because uh, particularly as one of the reporters that we quoted in the report said, uh, obviously there's no generalization that applies to all circumstances, but he said usually you're not in a position to, as a journalist in an unadjudicated case, make some kind of definitive finding about guilt or innocence in a sexual assault matter. But what you can report on is institutional response. 
and that's a place to bring people into the public square. And that's a matter of public interest because it has to do with the environment in which students study and employees work and so on. So there is a, a very important uh, journalistic subject here that, uh, that requires uh, attention and and in order to do good work we're going to have to keep talking about the kinds of issues that are in this report because they are not uh, always um, as basic as some of the mistakes that that Rolling Stone did make on this story yes at the back Hi, thank you Catherine Molly with the journalism school you, you said that the 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 problems here were systemic they were institutional Given that, that you're not sort of pointing the figure at any one particular individual editor or reporter, are, are there other stories from the Rolling Stone that, 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 should, that uh, the spotlight now should be drawn to um, if this is indeed a systemic institutional cultural practice? We wish we could answer that question, but we can't because we didn't look at Rolling Stone's entire record of reporting. We looked at one particular story and it took us four months. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, on the larger question of accountability, it has indeed come to light while we've been here that Phi Kappa Psi is indeed suing. And I wonder if you have any thoughts on that, how strong is their case, or just a general <laughs> sense as to what function that serves in the accountability for a journalistic mess like this. It's sound journalistic practice not to comment on other people's litigation. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please, at the back here. Uh, Joe Sykes, Uptown Radio. Uh, do you think uh, Sabrina Erdely should ever write again for a national magazine? I don't believe that's our decision. This, is the edition, this would be the decision of people who ask her to write for them. To go back to hypotheticals, if you were an editor, would you ever commission her to write a story? I think we've ruled out hypotheticals. <laughs> <laughs> nice try. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> You said explicitly in the report, and something sort of along the same lines today, that Erdely believed firmly that Jackie's account was reliable. Is there any way to empirically judge that? Or are you just going by the fact that there is no evidence in her notes or from conversations with her editors that she ever faltered? Let, let me tell you, we spent two days with Sabrina in Philadelphia on a snowy, wintry more January morning. The moment that was, you know, that really she can I say this, that she nearly broke down was that moment when she was narrating, uh, when, ja when she realized that Jackie, Jackie's account was not true. It was, she was on the phone with Jackie and she was narrating this. It was very painful for her. And I think more painful than all the other things that have been written about her was the feeling that she had been betrayed by a source that she trusted and had invested a lot of time and emotional energy on. But considering that another very emotional account has gotten us into this problem in the first place, I mean, is right, that well, I mean, it's, it's, grounds it's, yeah, for drawing certain point that kind of a, a Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a, at a certain point, it's kind of a metaphysical question as to how far into someone's mind you can peer. But uh, the evidence that's available f to us is consistent with her quite ardent uh, statements that she did believe this to be uh, true and. The reason the evidence is consistent with it is that she, um, she was continuously in, in touch with Jackie about the story. She was looking for other ways to shore up the story through reporting, though she didn't do uh, nearly enough in our judgment. Um, it wasn't, we don't see any evidence to the contrary, I guess, is the way that I would put it. Um, yes, over there, please. Uh, um, Yes, the gentleman standing up. We give preference to people at the back. Thank you. <laughs> so some people, including uh, Jonathan Maller at the Times, have suggested that gender may have played a role, that Sean Woods and Will Dana were reluctant to you know, question uh, a woman survivor's account. Do you think that if there had been more women you know, in, in high editorial positions at Rolling Stone, they might have been more skeptical? 
I have no way to judge that. I really don't. I believe I mean, there should be more women in higher positions yes, in for, administrations. Yeah. <laughs> I second that. Um, yes, please. Uh, as far as the practices, uh, we see in your report that the fact checker did try to improve the story and um, um, asked for um, accurate attribution of the quotations, yet the fact checker didn't seem to have any much weight into the decision making process. Do you think that fact checker, especially if you have the means to afford them, they should be involved in the decision making process? Yeah, I think we, we've um, tried to say that Fact-checking can only be effective if the checkers, no matter their position in the hierarchy, feel empowered to question writers and editors who may be much more experienced and senior to them. And in this case, uh, it's hard to judge. The checker did raise the questions, but she was uh, overruled. She didn't raise questions about every single issue by any means, but she raised questions about a couple of important issues and she was uh, overruled, and then the conversation died. Uh, there was no further deliberation about this. And uh, so I think if you're running a newsroom and you're going to invest in a checking department, which is a pretty substantial investment, then, you, then you'll want a system, you'll want expectations and policies that are shared where everyone understands that the checker has an equal place at the table and that it's their job to push back even against people who may be uh, senior to them. I think what we pointed out was this was part of a newsroom culture where there didn't seem to be much discussion and debate about important editorial decisions. And the fact-checking um, dynamic was part of that. Um, yes. Uh, as to the question of UVA's institutional indifference, um, there was a case study in the Rolling Stone piece of a woman with the pseudonym of uh, was it Stacy? Did you look at that? It, did Stacy exist, and was uh, the rendering of Stacy's case in the piece by Erdley accurate? Did you get a transcript at all from that nine-hour hearing that was mentioned? So, so uh, is this Jackie? So, that, yeah, so uh, we did look at that case. We didn't write about it, and I'm not sure that we we didn't conclude that there was a journalistic subject there that was. Uh, worthy of our report. Um, it's, a, it's an important case. There's no transcript that we're aware of, but we did, we did a look at it. A nine-hour inquest would generate a transcript, I can guarantee We, 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 we did see internal yeah. um, decision-making yeah. by, by the university, so we, we know the yeah. actions that the university took and the, and the investigative yeah. report that they had. So we did look at it, but we didn't write about it, because we didn't see the same kind of journalistic issues that we saw in some of the other ones. Would that have been one of the other cases that Will Dana was referring to as to alternate sure. uh, you know, anecdotes? Yeah. Sure, uh, there, not the only one. There was that, there was Emily Render's story, there was Alex Pinkleton's story, all of whom were, all of which stories were told to elderly. Um, yes, please. Yes, you seem surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gra grateful. Uh, could you maybe elaborate a little bit on your interactions with Sabrina? You said that you spent two days with her in the Philadelphia area. Um, what was her temperament like? Uh, how contrite was she? And just the extent to which she cooperated in your investigation? I don't think we want to get into too much uh, atmospherics, but we did spend um, six, seven hours with her over a couple of days in person. Um, she was highly professional. She uh, hung in there. She answered all of our questions. Um, and uh, then we were in touch with her from that initial set of interviews right through to the final week, and she was always uh, responsive to our questions. She spent an equal number of hours, I would imagine, or certainly a long number of hours with Andy Young, our fact checker, going forward with all of this. And uh, uh, so yes, she cooperated uh, fully and, and professionally, and she was not an employee of Rolling Stone, but she chose to do that. Would you say that she accepted accountability, or did she uh, ever try to eschew responsibility in your interactions with her? I think we just let her voice, it's all over the report, her quotations, just let it speak for itself, and then she also has issued this statement, I guess, last night, um, that she probably is her best uh, representation. Um, yes. Do you know how all this has affected, Do you know how all this has affected Jackie? We don't. We have no contact with her except through her lawyer, and her lawyer has refused to answer any of our questions. 
Um, yes, please. Yeah. I'm wondering if you think the fact that she was a freelancer or a, contri a freelancer or a contributing writer played into anything in terms of, you know, uh, whether there was a kill fee, the kind of financial stakes that she might have had that are pretty structural to magazine journalism and not having the story fall apart. You know, we, we might have asked about her contract details. We didn't. Um, we didn't really see evidence of that hovering over the story because she's been at the magazine for years. Uh, she writes one or two stories a year. She seems to have a very good, she had a very good professional relationship with them. And uh, the main contextual evidence was just that she took months to do this reporting. She did it very seriously. If you look at her notes, she's on the phone every day calling someone else. She spent time on a, three campuses, I think, that she never even used in the story. So her, her relationship with Rolling Stone was such that she wasn't anxious about how much time it was taking her. I think they did uh, close the piece in a bit of a hurry at the end. Uh, if they had uh, come across any of the tripwires that we tried to outline in the report, it wouldn't have been that disruptive to take another month or six weeks. We didn't see any evidence of that kind of pressure on this process. This was something that they, they did on their own. She took six months to report on this story. Yeah. And she could have walked away is what you're saying. She could have walked away from Jackie as an example. <laughs> she had other examples, other stories, strong stories to tell. Jonathan Wachtel with Fox News. Do you think that Rolling Stone should be sitting up there with you talking about the situation rather than you speaking about the report? I mean, there are obviously some questions that you can't pick up. And, and also, do you believe that it, you know, what are the pros and cons in the future for any uh, magazine or other news outlet if they uh, find themselves in this precarious situation to come forward and actually ask your university to do a review? I think it's a fantastic opportunity for all magazines. No. Um, <laughs> uh, it's a growth industry. No, it's not something that we um, would like to make a routine part of our practice here at the school either. But um, look, I'm glad that Rolling Stone volunteered to undertake this investigation. I really am, because it's, uh, it's an important moment in journalism. It's a very valuable case study, regardless of all of the other aspects of it. As a case study, as a piece of learning, it's, uh, you know, it has real value. And they did that voluntarily. So I'm, I'm very glad they did it. As to whether um, they should be up here, we'd love to have them out here at some point over the next, uh, you know, month or in the fall if, if we can't get it organized before graduation. I think they've talked about their willingness to, to uh, think about this in public as, uh, um, as time goes, goes by, but we'll have to see whether, whether that's something they follow through on. Yes, at the back. Maybe one more? One more, yeah. Hi, uh, Teo Armis, Columbia Spectator. Um, I was wondering uh, how exactly you hope to bring the lessons from this report back to the classroom to your students. Well, I think it's a pretty easy, uh, three-hour class to assign the story and the report and, and maybe some of the other good journalism that preceded the report from the, from the different uh, news outlets that kind of broke, broke the story down at first and just uh, and talk about it because it's, uh, you know, it's, it's such a complicated case in the sense that the findings range from the most basic to the most complex. And uh, so that was why we took the 13,000 words, was to really try to break it down in all of its fullness. Uh, because it's not just about the easy failures that, uh, that we tried to inventory. It is about this larger context of figuring out how to do this kind of work better. Thank you all very much for coming. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.